Welcome to Ambassador Program Fundamentals. When disaster workers leave their home and travel to another location to support a disaster operation, a warm welcome when they arrive is appreciated and gives the worker a sense of belonging to the disaster response team. The Ambassador Program is designed to be activated on large disaster operations. However, the option to activate the program for smaller operations or special events is also available. Let's begin with the course purpose. The purpose of this course is to guide those coordinating or implementing the Ambassador Program on a disaster relief operation to create a warm, welcoming environment for all workers upon arrival, throughout, and at the conclusion of their assignment. The Ambassador Program plays a key role in a disaster worker getting off to a good start when they arrive on the operation. Upon arrival and during their disaster assignment, all workers will feel warmly welcomed and wanted upon arrival on the operation. The workers know that staff services and the disaster operation expected their arrival. There are people available on the operation to help if they have questions or a problem. For many responders, this is their first experience away from home and they are entering an environment they're not familiar with. However, even the most experienced responder likes to see a Red Cross worker waiting to greet them and welcome them to the area. Next, we will look at the position descriptions for those who staff the Ambassador Program. We will look more closely at position descriptions in the next few slides, but here are some highlights of the core competencies required. There are two primary levels of workers for the Ambassador Program. The Ambassador Lead must have the ability to manage people as well as nurture the members of their staff. It is important that the lead has the knowledge of how a large disaster operation operates. There are many elements to a disaster operation and many questions will need to be answered not only around staff services but also about the general ongoings of a disaster operation. The lead will also need to run reports in volunteer connection like arrival rosters, air travel rosters, and staff rosters. The ambassador worker needs to be a people person, communicative, and mobile. We'll look at these items more closely in a few minutes. Let's now look closer at the ambassador lead role and position descriptions. The ambassador lead is usually appointed by the staff services chief and sometimes in collaboration with the local disaster workforce engagement lead or with regional volunteer services staff. It is important that the right person is selected as the ambassador lead. The lead will not only start up the program for the operation, but will also maintain the program and then scale down and demobilize the program. You will have to check with the staff services chief to determine who you as the lead will report to. The ambassador lead is accountable for ensuring that the ambassador tasks are successfully completed as required at all assigned locations. Ambassadors must create a warm and welcoming environment for all workers and anticipate worker needs based on the disaster operations environment. Workers will receive directions from their leads on additional specific information that may be needed. Next, let's take a look at what specific tasks an ambassador lead will need to perform. The ambassador lead will be tasked with identifying where ambassador leads are needed, how many are needed, the best process for recruitment, providing training and coaching, purchasing the supplies that will be distributed to arriving workers, and communicating with leadership as needed. The lead will often have to think on his or her feet to make quick decisions for the program. Next, let's look at another responsibility Ambassador Leads will have, checking and using staff services reports. Before the Ambassador Lead can complete many of the tasks listed on the previous slide, the lead must have information about the arriving workforce. Knowing how many workers are arriving and their arrival locations is necessary for planning. Leads should also review the air travel and arrival roster to determine the locations and times of responders' arrivals. The staff roster may tell you where the largest congregation of workers may be, like in hotels or staff shelters. Reading the current Incident Action Plan, or IAP, will help the lead follow the scale and scope of the disaster operation. The ambassador lead will need to know where to access and then how to filter the first three reports in Volunteer Connection. Next, let's look at our ambassador characteristics, what their tasks will be, and where they come from. Because ambassadors are essentially a welcoming committee, they should meet the following criteria. They should have enthusiasm for the American Red Cross mission. 
be exceedingly patient, have strong communication skills, and be extremely approachable. They should have the ability to quickly assess and creatively problem solve. They should model superior professionalism and have the ability to be mobile because of the need to work in airports and other large facilities. And they should be able to drive a vehicle, if applicable. Here are some tasks that an ambassador should expect to perform. The list on this slide is not a comprehensive list of what the ambassador worker will do. Mostly, the ambassadors will welcome arriving workers, direct arriving workers to rental car pickup locations or ground transportation areas at the airports, provide arriving workers with a welcome gift. We'll look at what those gifts may be in a coming slide. And answer questions from arriving workers. So, where do we find ambassadors? Ambassadors could include the following. Local Red Cross volunteers currently not assigned to another role could be recruited. The Staff Services Local Community Volunteer Lead or the Disaster Workforce Engagement Lead or Volunteer Services at the local regional chapter can identify potential ambassadors. These volunteers do not necessarily have to be disaster volunteers. There may be volunteers in other lines of service like blood services or service to the armed forces who would like to support the disaster operation. Event-based volunteers who are available to work limited hours in varying shifts could also be recruited. This can be accomplished through the staff services event-based volunteer coordinator. What would be the benefit of recruiting local volunteers and EBVs to be ambassadors? They are the most familiar with the local area. You could also recruit Red Cross workers assigned to another role for a temporary amount of time while awaiting their assignment to begin. There also may be staff services workers waiting for an assignment who could help out until local or other staff could be recruited. Remember, when recruiting from any of the pools listed here, always keep in mind if they are the right fit for the ambassador role. An ambassador staffing plan strategy will need to be developed to determine how many ambassadors will be needed. Unfortunately, there is no form or template to figure this out. The lead will need to think through the needs and develop a plan. Using a calendar or a table, the plan can map out the locations, number of workers needed, and anticipated length of time the ambassadors will be needed. Work with the staff services chief to create the plan and then be sure to share it with the chief. At airports, you may have to consider placing one to four ambassadors based on volume of arriving workers at a location in the airport where all workers will eventually walk past, such as baggage claim at an airport with one terminal, or near the rental car counters for a large airport where all workers have been instructed to report there for transportation upon arrival. At a staff in processing center or HQ district office, consider placing ambassadors at the front entryway of locations where workers are expected to report to, or at the in processing area, or where they receive orientation or their work assignment. Using a staff shelter as lodging for our workers is not the first choice and is only used when hotels are not available. Having ambassadors stationed at the staff shelter during high foot traffic times, such as 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., is valuable in supporting morale. When a large number of workers are centrally lodged at the same hotel, consider stationing ambassadors there during high volume times, such as 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. or when a large number are expected to check in. Consider placing ambassadors at large work sites like supply distribution sites or where workers are loading herbs to say good morning and welcome them as they arrive. You should determine this need in collaboration with the staff services lead. Airports will most likely be the priority location for ambassadors, but the other sites listed here are also important places to consider if you have a large cadre of interested and available ambassadors. You will need supplies to support the ambassador program. Securing Red Cross t-shirts or vests for the ambassadors can be done through staff services. The vests may come from logistics or the local chapter and the t-shirts may be specially made for the ambassadors. Under the ambassador lead tasks that we mentioned earlier, one was purchasing supplies. Leads will have to make a trip to the local dollar store or department store to purchase most of the items listed above. Purchasing items for the ambassador program is an allowable expense and can be done using a mission card or a Red Cross purchasing card. Talk to your supervisor about what purchase method works best. You'll have to be imaginative when doing the shopping. 
there will come a time when the number of staff arriving slows and the operation begins to scale down. Decisions will have to be made on how to demobilize the Ambassador Program for that disaster operation. Here are some questions that you may need to consider. Are the ambassadors still needed at the airports as volume drops significantly? Are districts consolidating so workers are being moved from one location to another? And would it be helpful to have ambassadors to welcome the transferring workers to the new district? Are there workers out processing and would it be valuable to have an ambassador there to send them off warmly? The ambassador lead will need to collaborate with the staff services chief to determine how to demobilize the ambassador program for that operation. There should be a plan in place as soon as it becomes obvious that the operation is scaling down. So how do we know that an ambassador program was successful? We look for certain outcomes. You often hear in Red Cross that we want workers to have a good hello and a good goodbye. We want workers to feel that they were appreciated for their time and the questions they had received answers. The workers participated in the disaster operation with a positive impression of the Red Cross that encouraged meaningful future engagement and interest in future deployment. And they experienced a model for exemplary customer service skills that workers can mirror in their interactions with each other, community members, and clients. Here is a list of resources that you will have to be a successful ambassador. You are always able to reach out to staff services leadership for assistance when needed. Your success as a worker is very important. If you need help and support, ask. Thank you for your time and interest in the Ambassador Program. Contact the Staff Services Lead in your region if you would like more information.